Welcome to the Weird Works Podcast. I'm Dr. Christy, your host. Join us for conversations about alternative and sometimes controversial healthcare topics. This podcast will provide the evidence that you need in order to make informed decisions about your health, to empower you with the facts that you need to advocate for your health, and to encourage you that there is hope your body heals. Join us from experts from all things weird, as well as the testimonies of people with stories of radical healing who were once told that perhaps their condition was a death sentence, that they would just need to live with it, or that drugs and invasive surgery were the only answer. Let's get into agreement that if there is something natural and non-invasive that could be helpful, that it could be your first option rather than your last resort. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome episode of the Weird Works podcast. So this is another one of our interviews in the series on breast implant illness. And so today in the studio, I have Trudy Callahan with me and she's going to talk about her decision to explant and kind of what led up to it. And so remember the reason why we're covering this topic on the podcast is because we have had so many patients make the decision like Trudy did to have explant, but there was a series of things that had to have gone wrong for them to suddenly consider it. And it's not always like an easy thing to detect or get diagnosed in the first place. And a lot of women who have breast implants maybe don't know about it, or maybe they're on the fence kind of deciding whether they have this thing that's kind of become more popular or, you know, more well known, I'll say, called breast implant illness. And then other people who are trying to make the decision to explant and just want to gather their information and resources. So wherever you are on that spectrum of decision making, we hope that this gives you knowledge and information and a lot of great resources. So welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So Trudy, do you want to just kind of tell us like the backdrop, like how long, when did you have your first set of implants? So I got my first set of implants in, I think it was 1995. Mm -hmm. Um, I got them. I didn't get big. I, you know, I was a tiny person. I wanted, I was very athletic. So I wanted to keep them small. I just I'm built like a boy. Can't tell whether I'm coming or going. So I wanted (laughs) something just so I could wear a sundress, you know what I mean? Um, I felt like I, I felt like I needed it. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, later on you realize as you get older, that it's not really what you need. It's what society needs, but that's a whole nother topic. True. Right. (laughs) Um, so I got my first set. Um, I was happy with them. I never had any issues with them. Everything was fine. Um, in 2007, uh, it had been quite a long time. Um, they had started to ripple. So I went back to my plastic surgeon Mm -hmm. um, and he obviously recommended that we go ahead and take them out, put a new set in. Mm -hmm. Um, They had just come out with the um, silicone ones, you know, that are kind of like the the beds that you lay on and it just kind of, you know, forms. Um, They weren't dangerous. They didn't leak. If the bag busted, it was kind of a gel form. So Mm -hmm. it wouldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made you feel safer about getting them. Right. That's you know what, what I mean? they're still telling people. And I, I actually yesterday just saw something on social media that they had cut it in half and showed like this gummy bear substance and how it doesn't escape. And we'll talk more in our expert who is was on the episode before you will talk about how really they're not, none of them are safe, but I want you right. to hear from the patient, like what they're being told. Right. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's what I was told. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I love my plastic surgeon. And so I, I went with his recommendation. Um, they were lighter, mm-hmm. they were better, which I meant a lot to me. Cause I was, like I said, I still played softball. I still did CrossFit. I still did a lot of activity. Yeah. So I got that set in 2007. I felt like it was within six months. I started getting very bad cysts on my breasts. So at this mm-hmm. point, I'm what, 37 years old. Mm-hmm. So I keep going to the doctor. Everybody's telling me it's hormones. I called the plastic surgeon. I was like, I like, you know, what's going on? Well, you know, hormones, some people are susceptible to cysts. Um, so I went with that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably about a year, maybe two years after the implants were in, I had quite a few cysts. It was very painful, especially during my menstrual cycles. Mm-hmm. They would get like 
you could literally see them bulging out of my chest. Okay. So I went back to my plastic surgeon and he was like, we can drain them, but they'll come back. Mm -hmm. So I had a surgery to have them removed. And he told me, he said, one of them was the size of a golf ball. That's big. That's huge. And he's like, I can't believe you. It must have been very painful. Yes, it was. Right. So, um, so now, you know, he went underneath to do the replacements. Now he had to go around the nipple to do, mm-hmm. you know, to get the cyst out. So right. now I've more scar got the scar there. tissue. Yeah. Right. Um, with that being said, I, I still kept getting these hard, hard, like, I don't know how to explain. I'm just very hard pea size, sometimes mm-hmm. bigger lumps. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, probably about the age of 40, um, started going through menopause, which I didn't think anything about it even though it didn't follow my mom's pattern. Yeah. That's really early. Yeah. Yeah. I just assumed because I worked out so much, I had a higher kind Mm -hmm. of testosterone level that maybe, right. I never had a strong menstrual cycle anyway. You know what I mean? So I just figured that was just my natural progression Mm -hmm. and I wasn't following my mom's. Um, didn't think anything about it. As time went on, obviously I I always had inflammation in my body. Mm -hmm. Once again, attributed it to a workout so much that, you know, you're yeah. always going to have you some You can always kind of find a reason and right. things kind of gradually sneak up on you. It's not so easy as like this happened and then all this stuff started occurring. Right. And yeah. so it was such a, at different points. And then, you know, the doctors are telling you everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the cyst started, my doctor sent me for a mammogram, of course, the mammogram, Mm -hmm. then there were so many cysts. They were like, all right, we'll come in this room. We got to do a, um, a sonogram ultrasound. ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did that. Well, then the doctor comes in and he's like, um, you have so many cysts. We need to do a mammogram. So basically I was told you have so many cysts. We can't tell them apart. We can't even tell you if you have breast cancer, but what we can tell you is if you come in every six months and get the same routine done, Mm -hmm. all three of these things, then we'll be able to at least compare. Yeah. See what's new, what's not, if they're getting bigger, if they're getting smaller, which they did, they would get big, they get small. I mean, it was just, it was what it was after quite a few years of that. I finally, honestly, I just got to the point where I was frustrated. I would spend Mm -hmm hours at the breast place at, at St. Vincent's hospital, which is great by the way, but I would send hours there. Right. And then I was like, is it, I mean, what's worse me not, I mean, me not being able to figure this out or me mm-hmm. pumping myself full of radiation every six months, not with just one thing, but with three different yeah, that's a things. Thing. And one mammogram for you guys who don't know is the equivalent radiation of 20 chest x-rays so you're having these every six months and then triplicate of that that's right. a lot of radiation and so for somebody who they don't know if you have cancer but they're obviously closely monitoring you to make sure that it doesn't turn into something we know radiation causes cancer so that's why I think Trudy was family was like okay what's worse right right I was just to the point where I was like it's yeah. You know what I mean? If you're just telling me it's cyst and it's not really anything else, I'm just going to roll the dice and go with it. And if mm-hmm. I feel something or something's painful, yeah. then I'll go back. Yeah. It's kind of where I went in my head. I just got frustrated. Um, it wasn't until I talked to my sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. So fast forward, my sister-in-law is, was having issues mm-hmm. um, with her implants and we got to talking And she's like, you know, Trudy, I really think a lot of the symptoms that you've described to me over the years, I think you might have breast implant illness, which is what I think I have. Right. So she actually kind of led me into that path. Does that make sense? It makes sense because what we're experiencing, and I think after you guys listen to several of the testimonials of women like Trudy who had the explant, you're going to hear similar stories. Like it's not easy to find. And then yeah. even if you suspect it, you still are kind of on the fence. And until you align with somebody who's already experienced it, which is why we're doing the series, then you're like the light bulbs go off. Right. Know? And I feel like breast implant illness is kind of a way, 
the equivalent of autism, everybody seems to have their own symptoms. Yeah, it's different. I mean, we can have similar symptoms, but it's always a different progression or exactly. a different, it's not like- it's not definitive. Like yeah, it's not definitive, book. right. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of things are. Right. So I think that that's the biggest problem is that it's not definitive. Yeah. So women can be like, oh my God, I had early menopause. That means I have BII or, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think you have to look at the accumulation of your personal journey. Agreed. You know, I mean, if you just had one thing, maybe it, that's not it. And yeah. you okay. need to make a decision on what's best for you. But if you have accumulation, I think Agreed. that's pretty Agreed. obvious, yep. which okay. for me, I think once I started putting the pieces together, like you said, I quit justifying mm -hmm. every little thing. And I started looking at things from that purview. Once Susan educated me, then I was like, oh, wow. And then I felt stupid because <laughs> I was like. I knew it. I just didn't fight hard enough for myself. You were on the right path. Yeah. But I felt like, I felt like I didn't fight hard enough for myself to be like, no, these aren't right. Take them out. Yeah. And I think a lot of that was like, you, like I said, I mean, I didn't want to go back to looking like a boy. I didn't, you know what I mean? Right. It's just, you know, there's a lot of emotional decisions that go into deciding to get implants in the first place right and so that's what we need to be real about is like even if women aren't feeling good sometimes there's still a hesitation to have them removed like what you're describing because it goes against why you made the decision to have them in the first place right and yeah. and for me it just I had to sit down and I was like what means the most to me I mean if somebody mm -hmm. doesn't like me because I have small boobs then really does that person mean that much to me yeah. does that make sense uh -huh. <laughs> you know so I was like, I, I kind of had to put it in perspective and it's probably because of age. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, since when did sweat glands define my help? Yeah. And that's yeah. what they are. So if you're not producing breast milk, then you have stopped becoming useful. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, you know, and it's funny because I breastfed my daughter for like two and a half, three years yeah. with my small little boobies. Yeah. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter what so apparently they work no matter what. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so. I kind of, um, I called aqua plastic surgery down South yeah. in Jupiter, which is who my sister-in-law was going to. Yeah. <clears throat> and I talked to, I think his name was Jeff. He's their kind of their consultant. Okay. I went through everything with him and he's like, yeah, you, so I, I just said, you know what, let's rip the bandaid off. Let's do it. And he said, our last appointment is, I think it was December 19th was their last appointment of the year. This was in August. Mm -hmm. I said, let's do it. And I ripped the bandaid off. And um, once I ripped the bandaid off, I really didn't have any second. You were no going back. Yeah, I didn't. I, there was no, I never sat there thinking, Ooh, should I really do this? I think I was just so dead set on doing it. Yeah, you were convicted at that point. Yeah, because I was mad. Mm -hmm. I was tired. I was mm -hmm. mad. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I also was older and I was able to, to distance myself from mm -hmm. what, television wants yeah, us to look the like societal norms. yeah the There's societal norms. right about body image and all of that yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. um and plus I was like you know what my booty's a lot bigger from doing squats and that's the go. end thing so nobody will notice <laughs> if you don't have it then you can have it going right right but so I was like well I got one out of two so I know. at least I got half the population that'll like me <laughs> um and, you know, I just, I think that was the biggest thing for me was getting over just the uncomfortableness yeah. of what I was going to feel like. Which I think it's real. We like appreciate you being vulnerable and raw about it because that's, a, that's going to be a part of the decision-making for anybody that's hearing the series. Yeah. And, you know, so, my daughter was born mm -hmm. right before I, I got them. So mm -hmm. she was young when I got them. So she, you know, we laugh about it all the time. She's like, I didn't realize you were this flat just yeah. said, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. So we kind of laugh and she's like, and she's like, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I just, yeah. you know, yeah. But we laugh about it because she had never seen me. Got it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That became your image for a while. Right. So let's talk about like, so once you got them out, some women are reporting that they almost feel improvement of symptoms like immediately like some women even like upon waking up after the surgery. So what was the post-op experience like? So um <clears throat> I went, um, I remember I was kind of coming to, and I remember I, I was, I thought something was wrong because mm -hmm. like it was just burning and I was like, 
And I, I, I remember I was like, I started kind of hyperventilating a little bit. And I remember the nurse was telling me to calm down mm -hmm. and I was like, something's wrong. It's burning. It's really burning. Mm -hmm. And that's when she was like, it's okay. It's your lungs. And I was like, and I remember kind of, you know, cause you're kind of out of it. And she was like, sweetie, you haven't used them in probably 20 years. It's okay. Oh, so you. that's when I found out that I guess one of the implants had actually, they had to pry it off my rib. Mm -hmm. So let me go back what again yeah. to my first set. Mm -hmm. Shortly after my first set, once again, I've always been athletic. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with exercise induced um, yeah, asthma. asthma. Uh -huh. I, I, and I started having problems breathing. Obviously, I just thought it was allergies. Fast forward to now at this point. No, nah, that wasn't it. It was my breast implants, oh, both yeah. sets, just because they, you don't think about it. They mm -hmm. sit there. Mm -hmm. And so I have a long torso. Yeah. So my lungs are mm -hmm. longer than most people. So literally since my first set, they just kind of settle. So she's like, you aren't using the full capacity of your lungs. Yeah. Haven't had any issues since then. Have not used an inhaler, have no problems breathing besides, you know, working out hard, typical. Yeah. When it's, when you're working out hard, right? Yeah. Not any fits of completely can't breathe. That's amazing. So. Hi everyone. This is Dr. Christy Harvell. In honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we are hosting a very special event. If you are local to the Jacksonville, Florida or surrounding area, we encourage you to grab a girlfriend and join us for our sixth annual Breast Cancer Awareness Health Fair right at our Wellness Center Health by Design. The first 40 people to register will get a swag bag full of samples and freebies. And we'll start the event out at 10 o'clock with my personal story as well as some life-saving information that I feel all women should hear. And that will be followed by a full-on vendor event. Some of the highlights that you can expect include thermography, free health screenings, muscle testing demonstrations, toxin-free skincare, and so much more. Please join us for an educational, fun, and life-changing event on October 29th from 10 to 2 o'clock at our Health by Design Wellness Center on Southside Boulevard. You can register on our website at healthbydesignfl.com or you can go to the Health by Design FL Facebook page. I can't wait to see you and your friends and family members there. And the doctor who we interviewed in series one, she explained the anatomy, but if you look at it cross-sectionally, like even for women who they don't, the implants don't adhere to the rib tissue, there's still just a tiny thin membrane between each rib and then your lungs, the blood supply, your lymphatic glands that are right underneath it. So like the implants usually are just like literally like paper thin separation between your lung tissue anyway. Yeah. And they're heavy. Uh-huh. And that's the other thing. So as a chiropractor, anything that you put on that it, they pull down, I mean, they literally pull here and that constricts the blood flow yep. and the nerve flow. And anytime you start to round, even just a tiny bit, it puts extra pressure on your neck and suboccipitals. It brings your head posture forward and it does narrow the cavity where the lung sits. So it's unavoidable. And the doctor who was proceeding you kind of explained a lot of that so it's amazing yeah. to hear you say you could breathe again yeah and what was funny is like I said I had the smallest pair you could probably get yeah. so I can't even imagine mm -hmm. if I would have like went Gone big there. big exactly um so afterwards was when she told me they had to pry it kind mm -hmm. of and you can see the muscle mm -hmm. tissue on it yeah, we're going to put her pictures on the YouTube video. So if you're listening audio, you might want to go also find the episode on the YouTube video. Um, all the women, if they have before and after pictures, which I believe everybody does, um, it's pretty incredible. So explain for the people that are watching what they lo are looking at when those pictures come up. So when you look at the pictures, if you, if you zoom in, you can mm -hmm. see actually muscle mm -hmm. on one of the implants from where they had to pry it out. Um, the both implants, if you zoom in, you will see yellow, fatty looking, very hard looking mm -hmm. cysts nice. and granules. And they were all attached to that. They were not in my breast tissue. Like I was being told they were attached right. to that. Right. Um, I know that because I have zero cysts now. Right. I haven't had any. 
Um, the unfortunate reality for me was because I did a lot of athletic activity for so long, mm -hmm. a lot of lifting uh, of weights and mm -hmm. stuff. The other thing they don't tell you is if they're not tacked down, they move. Mm -hmm. So mine actually tore a lot of muscle mm -hmm. in here. So it's something I'll never get back. So yeah. it looks almost a little deformed because yeah. it rips all that muscle away from the chest wall. Right, your pectoralis. Yeah, every time you here. lift or do something, mm -hmm. pick up a child. Yeah, exactly. You use your pecs. Anytime you use your body, your pec muscles right. are activating. So tell us, well, do you know, we talked a little bit about like the education that goes into it. Did your doctor ever tell you that they weren't lifelong devices? You know, I, I don't remember having that conversation with him. Um, it's funny because I've had a couple of my family members and daughters, friends get them recently. And I'm like, mm. you know, and, I'm, and you know, they're determined, mm -hmm. but they've been told that they're lifetime. Yeah. And I'm like, they have, oh. they still have with all the data. So yeah. there's new <laughs> research out. And so now this is super interesting. All implants, regardless of what class, because there's several different years where they improve the, like that they feel more lifelike, but they're not any safer. And the more jelly-like substance that they are, the softer, the more likely they are to leak or fail. Now up to five to seven, within five to seven years, they're saying like they all fail, but they don't have really great imaging. And like, unless somebody starts developing symptoms that are obvious, women don't really know what's going on internally until it escalates. But all implants now have to have a black box warning, which is the highest level of warning that the FDA puts out. The problem is, did you ever see the box that your implants came in? No. And it's, you know, you get a card with how many CCs it is uh -huh. and everything else. Yeah. And um, the sad part is, is you know, I, I look at these little girls and I'm like, mm -hmm. nothing is permanent. Even a hip replacement yeah. isn't permanent. The yeah. only reason yeah. it's yeah, I'm like, it's just permanent because most people that get hip replacements are older, so they don't need another. Their life, yeah, exactly. their lifespan isn't what yours is at 20 yeah. getting breast implants. Exactly. So yeah, that's totally true. So there is a black box warning, and we're gonna put that on every episode, um, so you can go and search it and find it. But the doctors who are using the implants are supposed to now give every patient a questionnaire based on the black box warning and have you initial every box saying that you're fully aware of A, B, C, D, E, and F. So that's interesting data, but most patients don't know it because the surgeon's the only one or the person assisting the surgeon who actually removes the implants from the box that it comes in is the only person that sees that. This is kind of like vaccines. Like most people never see the insert. They have to ask for it. Um, okay, so now let's talk about quality of surgeons. So can any surgeon remove implants? I mean, I, I think any surgeon can. Or will. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <should> they? <laughs> um, I personally, so that was another thing. My sister-in-law had told me about Aqua down South, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, to drive, but it was okay because mm -hmm. when you start doing the research, you have to realize that. So a lot of people will take them out and what they'll do is they'll pop the bag and basically drain it and then take the bag out. Well, they're not taking all the tissue out that the bag is that the mm -hmm. outer plastic mm -hmm. basically has infected. So mm -hmm. they're leaving that tissue in. So you're still staying sick yeah. or they're using that tissue to rebuild your breast. Mm -hmm. So you have a, you know, more natural, or so you have looks, boobs, yeah. but that's once again, negating the purpose it's disease. They're leaving the disease tissue there right. to rebuild, a, you know, a mound to make it look like breast tissue. I mean, it is right. breast tissue, but it's diseased. Right. It's, yeah. And you can, see from the pictures, mm -hmm. like I said, I mean, if they would have reused that tissue, I would have mm -hmm. kept the lumps. Yeah. Because right. I would have had, unless they took tissue out, cleaned the lumps off and put it back exactly. in. Exactly. Like, they they do that. do that. That'd be a really long extension. <laughs> it would have been. <laughs> so you had to go to somebody who understands how to remove the entire capsule around it. That's super important. And we will put a list of surgeons who are um, trained in this method. So that's super important. Mm -hmm. I know, was it your doctor who trains other doctors now in the safe removal? Yeah, I think, yeah. yes, at Aqua, yeah. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> you can put her doctor in case you are in Florida. But if you're not in Florida and we have a doctor who's tried and true and one of these patients that we're interviewing had an awesome surgery, I would get a hotel and come and do it. Like, Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Is this doctor is so awesome. I mean, I think the week I was there, there was a lady that had flown in from like mm -hmm. England. 
Yeah. So it's worth it. They yeah. It done correctly. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so did you work with anyone before the surgery, like to do any like detox or mold removal or anything like that? Mm -mm. Okay. No, I just wanted at that point, you know what I mean? I was just yeah. focused on, I want them out. Yeah, that's that okay. Makes sense. We're going to ask several people that because some people do some pre, you know, surgical treatment. It depends on what the symptoms were. Yours were pretty vocalized to the breast tissue. Other women, as you'll hear, it's more like chronic fatigue and chronic pain syndromes, like more systemic type issues. And so sometimes women find it helpful to do a detox prior to surgery mm -hmm. and then we continue to clean things up after right so when you came on site at health by design it was years after your surgery how soon after i i think i was here before my surgery are you here yeah and then we because my surgery was 2019 but yeah true. yeah and then i think i told you about it so I don't think that we actually did a detox. I think I just stayed on the medication that I was on. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, and then I had them out. And then afterwards, do you remember what we found? No. We oh yeah. That, that, you bet the mold. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that disease tissue, the biofilm that's created behind the implant between your implant and then right on that really thin chest wall, it creates a biofilm and that biofilm, because it's full of inflammatory chemicals and substances that aren't that are foreign to your body, it sets up a barrier where the, it's just a perfect platform for mold and yeast and fungus and parasites and metals and chemicals to live and get attracted to. So a lot of times afterwards, when we work with patients pre and post, we need to kind of clean up the scene to get the rest of it out of the system. Oh yeah. And even when I had a thermography, what, two years later, mm -hmm. there, it still shows up as mm -hmm. inflammation and in red. Yeah. In the lymph node area. Yeah. So there's methods to continue to monitor and keep the healing process going. Peter's trying to hold hands over here. He keeps pulling up. I think he's dreaming. Peter's been in every podcast, whether you can see him on the screen or not. He's somewhere in this room. <laughs> okay, so you said almost immediately you started feeling better. And then, um, it, so what else would you want to share? So what would you say to women who are considering getting implants? Any wisdom? I mean, you're you're going to have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if it's, it, if it's been a while since you've seen yourself without breasts, it takes a lot emotionally to be yes. able to look at yourself, yeah. um, and be able to be like, okay, I'm okay with this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after you get it done, I mean, it takes a while to heal, but they do fluff up a little bit more and you get a little bit more, you know what I mean? Like yeah, as time goes on, your body makes, yeah, yeah. It makes its own collagen and it'll fill right. And it'll you. fill in. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is a shock. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. the biggest thing mm -hmm. is you're going to have to emotionally prepare yourself mm -hmm. that I'm not saying you look bad or anything else. I'm just saying you have to emotionally prepare yourself for this is where I'm at. So that way you don't get them out. And then six months later, you're like, I can't take this and get them put back in. Yes. Just now you're negating the purpose again. What's the point of you're going back? Right. You're going back to square one. Exactly. So I think you have to get right in your head. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And there are other forms of reconstruction other than putting implants back <clears> in. Like sometimes they can use tissue from other areas of your body if you have enough to fill in right. and shape it. So again, working with the proper surgeon that'll be able to accommodate or accomplish the goals that you have, what you need to do. And it depends on how large you are and how big the implants were and what your breast tissue size was prior right. and what they're able to maintain. Like they had to remove a lot of tissue because it was so diseased. Yeah. So, you know, maybe she started out larger than she is now, but they had to remove that tissue, couldn't keep it. So everybody's situation is completely different. And a good doctor will be able to, you know, inspect and kind of give you a better healthy expectation of what right. will come afterwards too. Okay. And then resources, we'll put Aqua and your doctor, any yes. other resources that you found helpful, like reading materials or anything else that you want Yeah. To and I'm not a social media person. So I always got my information from my sister-in-law, but there are Facebook po pages. Yeah. There are, um, I think, I think his name's Jeff from Aqua. I think he has a Facebook okay. for women with BII and stuff yeah. like that. So. We'll put all those links. We'll find them for you and we'll put the links as well. And then, like we said, we have pictures. So um, we'll put that, you'll know what you're looking at because Trudy really did a great job of explaining it. And the doctor, um, go back to um, 
episode one in this series, if you haven't, she's going to explain that there are doctors who have specialized imaging now to find out, like Trudy was explaining what you see in the pictures, those cysts, they're called granulomas. And so once you have those, you definitely have to get your implants taken out. But now for women, if they are still deciding to have them or they have them and they're like, I don't think I have breast implant illness, like, do I get them out anyway? What do I do? At least it would be helpful to know that at the five to seven year mark, there is imaging that's becoming more popular that more doctors are getting versed in how to do, do this procedure to tell you if they've leaked or if they're dangerous before you find symptoms. So all that information will be in the show links. Yeah. Yeah. Any final words or comments, anything that we didn't go over that you think is important for the audience to know? No, I mean, I just, when you make the decision, you got to realize you're eventually going to have to get them out. So do you want to get them out now? Or do you want to get them out when you're 80? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. Eventually you're going to have to get them out. I don't care what any doctor says. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you. I know this is a hard, you know, vulnerable conversation, but I super appreciate it. I know anybody who's going through this, your testimony can help others. And it's only now becoming more popularized and a thing and an acronym and BII and breast illness. And I'm glad for it that the word is getting out there. But, you know, it takes people with experience. Sometimes people need to hear, like you had to listen to your sister. Right. Not, not everybody has somebody in the medical field or someone to speak with. And so, you know, I'm grateful for you being willing to put it out there. And, and I think insurance companies are starting to pay for it now, too. Mm -hmm. That'd be good to bring I think they're starting, yeah. Yeah. So that's a good thing to look into as well. Okay, well, well, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And then we will continue this um, series all the way through the month of October. So check back next week and we'll have more awesome testimony stories. Thanks for joining the Weird Works podcast. It's hard to say weird works. <laughs> Peter says peace. Americans spend $33 billion every single year on diets and weight loss products, and yet diets have a 95% failure rate. These statistics and my 18 plus years experience as a practicing doctor show me the real dangers of a cookie cutter approach to health and that truthfully, diets don't work. This is why I created the 9010 Lifestyle. For the people like you and me, busy and not willing to settle for less when it comes to our health and wellness. This program isn't just about feeling fantastic and or losing weight for good, it's a roadmap to upgrading your body and mind from the inside out while simultaneously suppressing the inflammation and suppressing the guilt that often comes with a high stress, high expectations and high performance. The number one reason the 9010 lifestyle is so effective and easy to maintain is that it gives you back your willpower instead of forcing it.